So thanks everyone for being here. Um, so today I'm so excited to announce um, TJ Billard, who will be giving a talk about their, their new book, uh, Voices for Transgender Equality, Making Change in the Networked Public Sphere, which just came out this week from Oxford University Press, which is really exciting. Uh, I'm sure many of you already know TJ, but I'm just going to do a quick bio as an introduction. So TJ Beller is an assistant professor in the School of Communication at Northwestern University, and then also by courtesy in the Department of Sociology. They are the founding executive director of the Center for Applied Transgender Studies in Chicago, which is the leading academic organization dedicated to scholarship on the social, cultural, and political conditions of transgender life. And TJ is also the editor of the center's flagship journal, the Bulletin for Applied Transgender Studies. Uh, TJ's research spans political communication, the sociology of social movements, and transgender studies, with a primary focus on the relationship between media and the US transgender rights movement which is uh, something I'm sure you'll hear about in their talk today. TJ earned their PhD at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at University of Southern California. Um, and just wanna give a very brief summary of, of the book for those of you who haven't read it yet. I know I tried to pre-order my copy from a local independent bookstore and they did not get it in time, unfortunately. Um, so uh, the book is uh, basically highlighting how activism works in this new decentered and hybrid media environment um, that we're now living in. And uh, TJ did this really cool ethnographic study at the National Center for Transgender Equality. So that was basically a case study um, to examine some of these things and uh, they discuss how this particular organization carries out transgender rights activism using things like mass media and social media, uh, community storytelling, and they kind of stitch all of those things together in really interesting ways. Um, and so we'll be taking uh, questions from the audience after uh, the talk. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, field or in the chat, and um, we will get to those afterwards. So thank you so much. Go ahead, TJ. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone see the screen? Yep. Okay. So thank you, everyone, so much for being here today. Thank you, Oliver, for agreeing to host and for the warm introduction. Um, it's always like exciting to be able to talk to any group of people about any of your work, um, but it's especially exciting to be able to talk to you know the cats audience um, and to you know be with all the all of these people who many of whom helped build this organization uh, with me and my co-founders and uh, and um, to be talking about my first solo book is just like incredibly exciting. I kind of can't believe that this day is finally here. Uh, so I really appreciate you all um, being here. Just as a small note uh, before I begin the talk, while this uh, lecture aims to illustratively summarize the research that is presented in the book, there are many points at which uh, more information on topics that I am briefly discussing can be found in journal articles that I publish based on the same data that informed the book uh, or occasionally other similar resources. And in those cases, a small QR code will appear at the uh, bottom right corner of the screen. Uh, so please feel free to scan those QR codes and save those links for uh, your later viewing. Um, okay, so transgender rights may seem to the general public like they've emerged into mainstream politics pretty much overnight, uh, but as many of you will know, uh, and for the trans activists who have fought tirelessly uh, to earn even modest recognition for this civil and human rights, uh, it has felt like anything but instant. Um, during the hopeful, albeit less transformative than initially dreamed administration of Barack Obama, transgender rights activists made big gains in federal and to a lesser extent state recognition of transgender rights. Uh, the National Center for Transgender Equality, which was responsible for many of these victories, tallied over 160 federal policy changes uh, protecting trans people and their rights between 2008 and 2016. Uh, so the Obama years. 
Um, these policies were not necessarily the result of particularly pro-trans administration, as many of us uh, will remember, uh, but rather uh, the culmination of a half century of slow, tiresome, often quite agitative activism that secured a place for transgender rights as a central plank of the Democratic Party's platform. But in 2016, things began to turn. Uh, while the transgender rights progress that had been made during the Obama years had been made relatively quietly, uh, trans people were nonetheless uh, thrust into the center of national political attention with the spread of Republican-sponsored bathroom bills in various states that mobilized fears about, in particular, trans women's use of women's public facilities and they mobilized these fears to introduce legislation uh, legalizing discrimination and various forms of oppression against trans people. And the most notable of these bathroom bills was probably the Public Facilities Privacy and Security Act, or HB2, in North Carolina. And HB2 required people uh, to use public facilities associated with the sex listed on their original birth certificate, regardless of their gender identity, and it was met quite quickly with kind of astounding acts of allyship that the movement uh, has not quite seen but would really love to see uh, since uh, with major corporations like Target, athletic groups like the NCAA, and even other state governments protesting or boycotting the state, leading to economic losses for the state that were estimated to be in the billions. Uh, the governor who advocated uh, this legislation, who you can see being shamed in that photo on the slide, uh, Pat McCrory, lost his re-election bid in the aftermath of the HB2 blowback, and the law was partially repealed. HB2 and the fallout that surrounded it even alienated a lot of Republicans who found targeting trans people to be strategically, if not ethically or politically, uh, a dubious decision. Uh, then presidential candidate Donald Trump even went on record around the controversy, uh, around the controversy um, saying that he would gladly let uh, transgender Olympian and reality star uh, Caitlyn Jenner use the women's restroom in Trump Tower in New York, uh, which she then did with a media team in tow. Um, this made it all the more surprising when six months later after this, uh, or six months after the largely unexpected election of Donald Trump to the presidency, he announced a new policy targeting trans people over Twitter. Uh, so on July 26th, 2017, I was in the temporary office space that the National Center for Transgender Equality, or NCTE, uh, was occupying in between successive office moves from their old offices across the street and their new offices down on K Street, uh, DC's kind of famous lobbyist corridor. And I was chatting away with then communications director Eric Dyson when Trump took to Twitter. And in a series of three short, uh, poorly capitalized tweets, he announced that he was banning transgender service members from the US Armed Forces, uh, a move that regardless of your opinion on militaries, uh, was designed to expel an estimated 15,000 transgender people from their jobs and to set a legal precedent for employment discrimination against trans people in the federal government. Within mere moments of these tweets being posted, NCT's phones began to ring, and what the longest and most tiring day of my field work was off to a banner start. So on this day in particular, um, I was about halfway through my first of two rounds of the ethnographic field work at NCTE, which political scientist Anthony Nouns describes as the Dean of Transgender Rights Organizations. Um, across 2017 and 2018, I conducted a combined 10 months of participant observation at NCTE, primarily focusing on the uh, communications or comms and the outreach and education or ONDE teams, uh, which together coordinated all of the organization's uh, communicative activities. Um, and the member of those teams you can see uh, listed on the slide here. So I participated in and observed things like the daily comms morning check-ins, weekly operations meetings, messaging meetings and team meetings, uh, standing meetings for different campaigns and special projects, uh, strategy meetings, trainings, rallies, uh, staff interviews with journalists and various other uh, relevant events. And in addition to participating in and observing this field work, I formally interviewed each member of the comms and the O&E teams twice and conducted additional interviews with members of the policy team uh, that worked closely with comms and O&E. And finally, I conducted interviews 
with members of NCTE's Voices for Transgender Equality, uh, Sparkling Sound, I said the name of the book, uh, or VTE and Families for Transgender Equality, or FTE, uh, which were two projects that did important communications work for the organization. Um, and together, these two projects established a national network of about a thousand community storytellers who received media and communications training from NCTE to help make them effective, effective spokespersons and who were frequently you know, deployed, quote unquote, uh, for various purposes, ranging from uh, testifying before state legislatures to writing op-eds uh, for their local papers uh, to serving as sources for journalists working on national news stories uh, to you know, pushing for change in local school districts. And it was on the basis of these observations and interviews that I developed um, the core argument for the book. The argument that I lay out in the first chapter of the book, uh, like 90% of which is quite handily available in the Google Books preview, if you want to go check it out, um, builds on lines of scholarship across the fields of communication, sociology, and political science that are focused on media activism, social movement organizing, digital politics, and the networked public sphere. And as I argue, the rise of the contemporary transgender movement has occurred at a very particular time in the development of the media system. And the contours of the movement have been shaped by this you know, new media environment in really important ways. The rise and salience of trans issues in recent decades has been secured less through increasing representation in mass media, though that representation has obviously increased, um, and more through an apparent omnipresence of trans people across the various media and communication streams that people experience in daily life. Uh, so whereas activists of earlier eras could fight for representation on four broad cast television networks and in a handful of national newspapers with confidence that success would mean their issues were experienced by the vast majority of the population, activists today have no such assurances. Uh, so obviously, uh, the theories of media activism and social movement communication that were developed in the era in which that was true aren't particularly useful uh, for understanding contemporary activism. Well, thank goodness that scholars have re-theorized uh, digitally native social movements. Yes, except that the field has largely traded a myopic focus on mass media for a myopic focus on social media in theorizing activist efforts to make change through media and public communication. Um, social media are largely considered by many activists and academics uh, to be the media of social movements, uh, the media through which Movements organize themselves, represent themselves to the public, and make claims on the state and other institutions that are invested with social, cultural, economic, and political power. But the transgender movement isn't a hashtag movement or a networked protest movement or even a digitally enabled movement. It's an old school social movement in really the most traditional sense that just happens to be native to the digital environment. And in fact, the same is true of a lot of today's most kind of uh, effective social movements, but our theories uh, for understanding that uh, don't necessarily reflect that fact. So this is especially clear when we consider the role of organizations in social movements. Um, scholars that have attempted to grapple with the changes that digital technologies have brought to social movements have typically fallen into two broad camps, uh, and I'm putting them in these categories. They wouldn't necessarily put themselves there. Um, but in one camp are the organizational transformationalists who have focused on how uh, political organizations use digital media in order to enhance their organizational capacities um, and to communicate with their stakeholders. But these scholars have tended to ignore the wider public uh, to instead focus on how organizations relate to predefined constituencies uh, like their movement adherents who they're trying to mobilize. In the other camp are what I call grassroots transformationalists who have focused almost exclusively on how the affordances of digital technologies allow grassroots or otherwise decentralized activist movements like the movement for Black Lives or Me Too to uh, organize without organizations, to increase the visibility of their causes outside of mass media and to push with variable success uh, for change. 
But typically, these scholars ignore streams of communication in society beyond digital media, except to construct them as the monolithic other that is the old media against which new media are defined. The problem is that the public communication infrastructure is now far more complicated than this argument suggests. Um, important sources of political information fall outside of the old and new media distinction and even span the boundaries between them. Uh, as the media sociologist Sandra Balberkeach outlines in her communication infrastructure theory, people are embedded in complex storytelling systems, and those systems span uh, macro, meso, and micro levels. And in the networked public sphere, each of these levels uh, is experienced in both digital and physical space. Um, so at the macro level, we have uh, mass media, or those media as I define them, that uh, one, have an imagined audience of the entire nation. Two, are owned by large national media corporations or international media corporations, whether they are for-profit or non-profit, so CBS, but also NPR. And that three, attract large audiences. Um, at the mezzo level lie local and community media, which have an imagined audience of some subnational population defined either by geography or social identity or lived experience. And these media also generally attract smaller audiences. There is like a very large drop off uh, in audience size between the smallest mass media outlet and the largest local or community media outlet. And then finally, at the micro level is where uh, social networks connect people with family, friends, colleagues, community members, casual acquaintances, and others with whom they communicate about personal and collective concerns. Um, and these social networks include the bonds of close people who live daily life together uh, offline and uh, also the often looser bonds of people who are connected only through digital media. And together, these sources of political information, all of which are connected by flows of information, perspectives, and opinions uh, that are kind of indicated by this complex web of um, arrows on the slide, um, form the networked public sphere in which individuals and communities engage in public debate, form public opinion, and at least ostensibly influence the state. And this map of the network public sphere, uh, complicated as it is, um, begins to hint at why achieving change has required pioneering new approaches to activism, as seen in the work done at NCTE. And these new approaches to media activism are the focus of Voices for Transgender Equality. Um, the book's core argument is that contemporary activism is no longer structured around achieving visibility in mass media because they have been decentered as the primary avenue for the flow of political information, but neither is it structured around social media visibility. Instead, contemporary activism takes quite a holistic approach to activism that seeks influence across the communication system. And this system includes mass media, but also extends into local and community media and interpersonal communication networks, both digital and face-to-face. -face. I further argue that the chimerizing influence of digital technologies, the way they fuse the logics, the context, and the practices of different media requires the concurrent management of every domain of the communication system. And this type of system-wide management is necessary to maintain influence over the flows of political information about transgender issues and identities, and to consequently improve the socio-political standing of the trans community. And this is a really tall order for short-staffed, overworked social movement organizations like NCTE. It's one thing to have a media relations manager or a team of them, if you're lucky, that works with journalists at the major newspapers and broadcast outlets and to work with them to secure uh, sympathetic coverage. But it's another thing entirely to have to have a small communications team that works to saturate a diverse ecology of print and digital news outlets and local media outlets in markets across the country and community outlets targeting any number of identity-based groups and both public and private conversations across multiple social media platforms. And all of these are influencing each other at the same time while trying to fill them with voices in support of your cause. But this is what NCTE did 
on the day of President Trump's military ban and on every other day I spent with them. They navigated this complex game of basically whack-a-mole that is created by the contemporary communication system in which failing to control the messages in one area of the communication system leaves each other area open to influence from oppositional forces. In order to make change, you kind of got to whack every mole at the same time and then like, like hold them there. Um, and in my book, I used the phrase a politics of flows to describe this general approach to activism developed to manage these complex and often unpredictable exchanges of political information and in doing so to make change in the network public sphere. My book builds this argument across six chapters that take apart and deeply analyze the communication system's constituent parts and the forms of activism that NCTE developed to affect each of them. And along the way, I introduce a number of novel analytic concepts that I hope will be uh, useful to scholars uh, working across the study of media, technology, and social movements, and uh, to people trying to understand the role of media in trans rights movements. And for the remainder of this talk, I want to focus on two specific cases that are recounted in the book. The day of Trump's military ban in the summer of 2017, which I have already teased, and the launch of the Won't Be Erased campaign in autumn of 2018, both of which represent uh, cases of significant antagonism from the Trump administration that required fast and flexible activism uh, across the breadth of the communication system. And in doing so, I'll also try to introduce just a selection of the new concepts that I developed that we've uh, throughout the various chapters. So uh, we left off with the phones ringing at NCTE uh, mere moments after Trump announced his ban on transgender service members uh, by tweet. Uh, the first and uh, likely last time that executive policy was set on Twitter, uh, if for no other reason, because it's called X now. Um, and for about 20 minutes, then comms director Eric and the comms staff took frantic calls from reporters looking for comments and interviews. Uh, NCTE staff darted from office to office, trying to figure out what it is they should be doing. Uh, Mara Kiesling, the executive director of NCTE, called everyone into the conference room to set up a centralized war room. And there, staff coordinated communications with journalists, policymakers, uh, coalition partners, and transgender community members around a shared strategy. The immediate priority was a press release, uh, which the war room jointly drafted as staff ignored the still ringing telephones. The president positioned this in terms of military readiness. Trans people hurt readiness, so in our statement and interviews, we need to focus on military readiness and the harm throwing trans people out does. This was declared by Harper Jean Tobin, the director of policy in this war room. There are 15,000 trans people in the US military, and we need to focus on what throwing out 15,000 qualified service members does. And let's not make this don't ask, don't tell part two. That won't help anything, even though journalists would want to paint it as that. This isn't don't ask, don't tell, Rafi Friedman Gerspan, the director of external relations, quipped. It's just like don't serve. Yeah, I like that. This is not don't ask, don't tell. This is don't serve, don't serve, Mara rehearsed. Everyone quickly jotted down this brainstormed phrase to use in the press release and Eric and communications manager Jay Wu huddled to craft the final wording before immediately posting it to the website and emailing it out to NCTE's press list. This is worse than don't ask, don't tell. This is don't serve, don't serve. This is an appalling attack on our service members. It is about bigotry rather than military readiness, reason, or science. It is indefensible and cannot stand. The president wants to discard thousands of trained and skilled troops who are already serving honorably and have done nothing but be honest about who they are. To turn away qualified recruit recruits simply because of who they are is a shameful way to show our country's gratitude to the people who serve our country. It hits all the beats you would expect from a movement organization that is looking to be quoted as the counter perspective to an institutional actor, in this case, the president. There's indignation, there are general references to the illegality of discrimination, and there's a comment on the political consequences of the policy decision, uh, and that's kind of what you would expect. But in a media environment in which journalists are just as likely, if not more likely, to pick up a source uh, quote from Twitter as from an official press release, NCT also posted the statement to Twitter. But the version, or rather versions, of it that were posted there were different. 
In contrast to the analytic, albeit still emotional, uh, tone of the original press release, NCTE's tweets made more boldly emotive claims, such as using the lives, the careers, and the service of hashtag transgender troops as a political wedge is disgusting. The emotive tone of the tweets was intended to encourage individuals, and in particular, the hyperactive political hobbyists of Twitter, to share NCT's tweets by retweeting them because that base level emotionally charged content gets reshared far more than analytic content on Twitter, even as it's perhaps less acceptable for conventional journalistic communications. NCT was also keenly aware that journalists' perceptions of what issues were newsworthy were shaped by Twitter. And so ensuring a statement that was primed for heavy circulation among the Twitter politicos uh, increased the odds of getting journalistic attention by increasing the number of politicos talking about the issue. And this constituted a kind of digital facelift, as I refer to it, that were given to traditional tactics of media relations. And this was only one of many that NCT implemented on a regular basis um, during my time in the field. Over the rest of the morning, the team prepared Mara and NCT's other media principles for a series of broadcast television uh, and the occasional high profile enough radio or print interview, places like Reuters, uh, MSNBC, CBS, Fox News, and so on. Uh, in one interview that I accompanied Mara with uh, for uh, a journalist from CBS News, uh, she quipped that Trump's decision on transgender troops was, quote, dilettante policymaking by whim and tweet. Um, other news outlets were given statements from NCT's staff instead of Mara. Uh, NCT had uh, standing relationships with quite a few of these journalists because they frequently covered trans topics. People like Katie Steinmetz at Time, Dominic Holden at BuzzFeed, and Nico Lang at Grinders, then newly launched but now defunct into. Uh, others NCT had never worked before, and the journalists sometimes didn't know anything about the organization other than that having transgender and equality in the name made them come up on Google and made them sound like they were probably a pretty good place to go for a quote. Uh, so for example, an intern at Sirius XM uh, called to get a quote for Tim Farley's talk show, but didn't know who she wanted a quote from. Uh, and it ended up that policy director Harper Jean was offered up for an unanticipated 12 minute live interview uh, with Tim. Around midday, however, NCTE changed tack. At that point, most of the major news outlets had been scheduled and even some unanticipated outlets like Elle, Harper's Bazaar and Vanity Fair. Mara declared in her parting shot before heading out of the office to NBC Studios, we need to make sure trans voices are being heard on this. As staff repeatedly told me that day, knowing about the transgender veteran who lives in your county is far more important than knowing in general that there are trans people in the military. So staff switched to getting the voices of transgender service members and other transgender citizens in major press outlets, as well as in local and community media. Um, Jay and digital media manager Jason Errol worked with Director of External Relations Rafi and Education Program Director Rebecca Kling to connect news outlets from around the country with local trans people, uh, referred to internally as community storytellers, uh, who were part of NCT's uh, VTE uh, and FTE projects. And these projects mobilized uh, VTE and FTE network members to contact political representatives, connect with local reporters, and get their stories placed in local community and national media outlets. And the VT project, quite thankfully, had several veterans on the role, including more frequent collaborators like the retired Army Colonel Sherry Sukowski, uh, retired Army Major Evan Young, and Air Force uh, veteran Cynthia DeVille. Uh, staff connected these veterans with major media outlets uh, uh, to kind of like humanize the transgender service members who were being coarsely disgusted, uh, or coarsely, sorry, coarsely discussed uh, in stories on Trump's tweets. And in one case, uh, I actually worked with journalist Maddie Kahn at Elle uh, magazine to secure an interview with Cynthia DeVille that ultimately took the form of a confessional style video titled, uh, A Trans Air Force Veteran Responds to Trump's Ban. And these stories recentered the transgender service members in question and focused on the material impacts of Trump's proposed policy. 
Most VUT veterans, however, were connected with local media outlets where they lived instead of outlets like L. Um, and the value of local media for NCTE was intimately tied to what I call its placefulness. And by that, I mean the strategic value of placing storytellers in local media was the specificity of locating trans people within a social world based in geography. For example, the Wisconsin State Journal ran a series of articles focusing on VTE storytellers with histories of military service whom NCTE had connected with the publication. And two of those storytellers were featured as the centerpieces of news articles that clearly articulated the consequences that the ban would have on their lives. And significantly, both of these storytellers were positioned throughout their stories in relation to their Wisconsin geography. So Army Master Erica Stoltz, for example, was referred to as a Sun Prairie resident and a La Crosse native. Likewise, retired Army Colonel Sherry Swakowski was referred to as Sherry Swakowski of DeForest and as a Mantawak native in an article that was titled, Trump Ban on Transgender Military Service Hits Home for Some in Wisconsin. Beyond factors like religious affiliation, class, current employment sector, anything like that, any of which could have helped an audience identify with the storyteller, geography became the basis for members of the public to identify with trans people because it was likely that they wouldn't find other reasons uh, to willingly identify with these storytellers. NCT similarly worked to place VTE members with histories of military service in media serving particular identity communities, like media serving Black American audiences or LGBTQ plus audiences. And the value of this community media, as I describe it for kind of descriptive ease, um, was in contrast intimately tied to what I call its placelessness. Uh, and that is to say, the strategic value of placing storytellers in community media was the universality of locating trans people within a social world based in collectively held but fundamentally imagined identities. And in both of these cases, uh, trans people were brought into social proximity, whether literal or figurative, with people. And these stories made Trump's proposed ban not just a national policy decision regarding a culturally remote, marginalized group, but a grave decision with material impacts you know, close to home, uh, whatever that meant for these people. And over the following days, staff continued to connect VTE and FTE network members with various uh, media outlets, mass, local, and community. Uh, they pushed out stories over NCT's social media accounts, and they encouraged trans people on NCT's contact list to make their voices heard in their communities. And this flurry of panicked communications returned to a routine churn, and within a few days, the news cycle mostly blew over. Um, I'm sure Trump did something else uh, wild and horrific that drew the attention away, though I can't remember today what that would have been. Um, but still, conversations continued over social media and in communities as the implications of Trump's tweets uh, were deliberated and as the stories of countless transgender veterans and service members were heard, shared, and reshared. Well over a year later, crisis struck once more. And crisis struck frequently in between uh, those two events, but a, a particular crisis that I'm going to talk about struck. Um, and early on the morning of Sunday, October 21st, 2018, the New York Times published a report detailing the contents of a leaked memo from the Trump administration's Department of Health and Human Services. The memo was, per the Times reporting, part of an effort to establish a legal definition of sex under Title IX. Were such a memo to be uh, put into policy, transgender people would, as put in the original Times headline, be defined out of existence. Media relations manager Jillian Brandsetter raised the alarm as soon as the Times article was published that Sunday. By time NCT staff began to wait and look at their phones to find her panicked email, she'd already begun drafting a statement. Executive uh, Director Mara called her shortly thereafter, uh, coordinating with Jillian on an angle. Uh, by 10.30 a.m., a finalized press release was sent to journalists. Uh, like most of these press releases, it began with a comment deriding the cruelty and political ineptitude of the leaked memo, uh, the kind of comment news articles would uh, quote as the oppositional perspective. However, it shifted after introducing the language of erasure. No rule, no administration can erase the experiences of transgender people and our families. 
The release was no longer speaking to the media or in response to the Trump administration. It spoke directly to the trans community. Two transgender people, I know you are frightened. I know you are horrified to see your existence treated in such an inhumane and flippant manner. What this administration is trying to do is an abomination, a reckless attack on your life and mine. But this administration is also staffed by inexperienced amateurs overplaying their hand by taking extreme positions that ignore law, medicine, and basic human decency. If they are hoping we will give up, they should reconsider the power of our persistence and our fury. Half an hour later, it was adapted and posted to Twitter, where it was retweeted almost 30,000 times. But without the hashtag won't be erased, that would go on to define the ensuing campaign. By the end of the day, the hashtag was in use uh, around the office, uh, and it sat at the top of the Google Doc that then Deputy Communications Director Jay Wu had created to be shared with coalition partners and VTE and FTE members containing messaging guidance, stock social media graphics uh, for organizations to apply their own brand colors and logos to, uh, and as a guide for individuals to hold their own in-person, won't be erased rallies. After distributing, uh, or after drafting and distributing the press release, Mara convened staff to plan steps for a sustained campaign uh, for fear of letting yet another world ending crisis for trans people slip off the public agenda within a day or two. The comms team decided that a hashtag would promote a sense of collectivity and increase public awareness about the mounting resistance. So drawing on the language of the statement that Jillian and Mara had drafted, uh, digital communications manager Laurel Powell suggested the hashtag won't be erased. Uh, the social media portion of the campaign would center on the message of basically, I'm trans, I'm here, and you can't redefine me out of existence, which is a sentiment aptly captured by the hashtag won't be erased. So NCT would encourage trans people to post selfies using the hashtag as a symbolic act of counter invisibility. And it would also provide social media shareable graphics for people who wanted to make their solidarity visible, but who didn't want to share images of themselves. And it was also decided that NCT would send out an email to its entire list, including all VTE and FTE members, with the mobilizing portions of the statement, as well as the hashtag and shareable graphics. Uh, the other main portion of the campaign would consist of a protest rally outside the White House. So after the call was concluded and they had the time to design the graphics, Jay sent out an email to all staff directing them to attend the protest rally the next day and to, as soon as possible, post a selfie or NCTE created graphic with the hashtag. Within a few hours, several staff had complied and each of their selfies received hundreds of likes, dozens of retweets, and inspired responses from other trans people and allies posting their own selfies, setting off what would be the first of many waves of the Won't Be Erased social media campaign. Laurel also tweeted out a call for trans individuals to post selfies or an NCT graphic with the hashtag and a separate call for allies to post their support with an NCT graphic and the hashtag all tweeted out from NCTE's accounts. And each of those calls received uh, about 600 retweets. And over the course of the day, thousands of individuals, many of them seated by NCTE staff, VTE and FTE members uh, in their social networks started sharing their own selfies and posts uh, using the graphics. So by the end of the day, um, this was all happening at the kind of interpersonal level, but there were also allied organizations like the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights uh, that followed NCT's messaging guidance to release their own statements and share them over social media. Um, other organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund released their own statements over social media. And uh, most of them used the won't be erased hashtag and received thousands, if not tens of thousands of retweets. So we're reaching a kind of critical mass in, in the digital media sphere that meant that now news articles were also starting to be written about NCT's fight against the Trump administration and about the burgeoning online movement. Several of these stories were, as Executive Director Marr put it, basically promoting uh, NCTE's upcoming rally. So the next morning I arrived to NCTE uh, to staff excitedly chittering away about the fact that the newest New York Times article on the Trump administration's memo and on trans people's response to it credited the launch of uh, Won't Be Erased to NCTE and even included the hashtag in the headline. 
Uh, they were also celebrating the fact that Times was not doing the whole both sides nonsense. Um, and there weren't quotes from hate groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom, who I swear to God, most newspapers had like a quota of like, if we mention trans people this many times, you have to mention ADF this many. Um, Jay also wondered aloud if the story was on the front page of the New York Times above the fold. Uh, I joked that there was no fold on a computer screen, uh, but we made sure to get a physical copy, and indeed it was above the fold. Later that day, NCT held its rally outside of the White House, filled with all of the BTE and FTE members who were in driving distance of uh, DC, uh, and any allies mobilized by the pretty viral Facebook event invite that had been circulating for it. Uh, I held the iPhone live streaming the rally on Facebook, uh, which you can uh, see was later embedded in the New York Times, uh, and it was viewed over 200,000 times and, uh, and shared over 2,500 times on Facebook alone, not counting however many people saw it uh, in news stories. By the next day, NCT alone had been featured in almost 600 news articles around the world, not including broadcast media. And that's only the stories that mentioned NCTE. Uh, there were countless more that also featured the campaign uh, itself without talking about the organization. Uh, highlights included New York Times, MSNBC, uh, Associated Press and Reuters uh, Newswire stories, and a New York Magazine article that included uh, the Twitter post by Jay and Laurel that created Won't Be Erased, uh, and a Slate article that featured a 19-year-old non-binary teen who had attended the preceding day's rally. DT and FT members across the country, inspired by the campaign and supplied with a rally kit that included graphics, signs, and talking points that came from NCTE, uh, they began to help hold protests in state capitals and major urban centers across the country. And inspired by this apparent groundswell of NCTE-led resistance, a number of celebrities, including Amy Poehler, Ilana Glazer, Abby Jacobson, Amy Schumer, Laura Linney, Sarah Ramirez, and many, many others, uh, contacted NCTE and worked uh, with them to roll out a series of selfie-style videos standing up in support of trans people, which they posted to their own Twitter profiles and occasionally other social media platforms. And they did so with, of course, the hashtag of won't be erased. Importantly, this social networking strategy wasn't centralized in the way that the organization's mass media work was, but it also resisted being decentralized in the ways that scholars have typically thought of networked movements and social media-based activism. NCT's work could be best characterized, I argue, as centralized decentralization. It was centralized to the extent that NCTE was responsible for providing the knowledge, skills, and resources that required storytellers, uh, and on this case, celebrities, uh, to navigate their own interpersonal publics in ways that advance the movement's aims, all while remaining relatively invisible in that process. But it was also decentralized to the extent that NCT didn't have control over what people said or did with the resources it created, nor did it want that kind of control. That would be an unmanageable amount of work. And so NCT, in essence, created a self-mobilizing network that gave them reach into interpersonal publics across the nation in a way that appeared organic rather than coordinated. In short, NCT's Won't Be a Race campaign affected social change by empowering transgender individuals and allies to impactfully communicate their subjectivities online and in their local communities. And beyond affecting the discourses of social media or influencing the attitudes and opinions of the uh, individuals and the institutions that they interacted with in daily life, NCTE used social networks to create what I describe in the book as digital news events or something that basically like the fact of digital circulation becomes itself uh, significant enough to be news. And these digital news events secured sympathetic coverage of transgender social and political issues in various other media, local, community, and mass. And by coordinating the campaign in such a way that social networks, local and community media, and mass media all carried messages about transgender equality, NCTE seized control over this political information environment, setting the terms of debate on transgender rights in ways that are still seen today. We still see headlines all the time that use the language of being erased to talk about anti-trans legislation. So I'm gonna set aside storytelling and get uh, metaphorical for a second. 
I live in Chicago, Illinois, where every year the Plumbers Union Local 130 pumps a mysterious orange powder into the Chicago River to magically dye it a brilliant green in celebration of St. Patrick's Day. And over the course of a couple of days, the green color fades as new water from Lake Michigan enters the river and as the green water flows down into the Blue Des Plaines River. This process is safe and clean, giving the city a short burst of unnatural color to mark an otherwise quite unremarkable holiday. And it may sound strange, uh, but this image uh, of the river being dyed and the green slowly fading as flows of water dilute the color into nothingness almost perfectly matches how I envision the process of activism in the networked public sphere. If we revisit my map of the network public sphere, we can see the three domains of mass media, local media, and community media, uh, and social networks uh, that comprise this uh, communication system. And they are all connected and conjoined by streams of communicative flow. And if we imagine the messages that flow in this system as water, we can think of activism as depositing dye. When activists attempt to shape one domain of the communication system, they drop dye in it. And that, that dye colors the waters pooled in that domain, and as waters flow from one domain into the other, the water carries some of that color with it. But if activists drop dye in only one domain, then as that water circulates, the color becomes diluted enough that it ceases to be visible. If, however, activists drop dye in all three domains, then that color doesn't dilute, or at least not nearly as quickly. Instead, that colored water circulates from domain to domain where it can be seen by all. And if they adequately understand the currents that flow through the system, activists can be strategic about when and where in each domain they drop dye to maximize its circulation. And this approach to activism represents what I call a politics of flows. The, this kind of activism is focused less on affecting individual media types or media narratives or media producers, and more on transforming how information flows through the communication system, shifting the locus of action away from targets and towards processes. And this necessarily transforms what the repertoires of action are, as well as the kinds of resources that are required by movement organizations trying to succeed at making change socially and politically. And the cases presented in my book each uh, illustrate this in different ways. And as I observed while I was at NCT, other social movement organizations have transformed their activism in the same ways that NCTE did in the wider LGBTQ plus movement, in the reproductive rights movement, and various other progressive movements, and ironically, in the anti-transgender movement. NCT often found themselves up against opponents like the Alliance Defending Freedom, who were using variations of the same strategies they were. So what now, where do we go from here? Um, well, at the start of this lecture, I mentioned that in his tweets dismissing 15,000 trans service members from the armed forces, Donald Trump justified his decision by claiming that providing transition related care to service members was simply too expensive. And similar claims about the cost uh, burdens of providing transition related care on both public and private health systems uh, have been mobilized to support bans on providing that care, usually providing that care to trans youth. And while I would personally argue that some form of care being expensive is no excuse not to provide it, uh, even so, it isn't true uh, that transition related care is a cost burden. Um, the actual cost to provide all members transition related care equates to 22 cents per month per member for military provided insurance and between 1.6 and 6 cents per month per member for private insurance. So Trump's policy decision and the policy decisions of so many since then were justified, if not motivated, obviously, uh, by outright disinformation. And indeed, misinformation is in many ways the defining feature of public debate on trans rights, not only in the US, but also in the United Kingdom, which has earned itself uh, the not so loving nickname of Turf Island. So given the undeniable centrality of mis and disinformation to transgender politics, uh, my next book project, uh, which I'm already hard at work on thanks to generous support uh, from the William T. Grant Foundation, builds on the research from this book to analyze the central role of misinformation and disinformation in anti-trans movements, political strategies in both the US and UK, um, why these strategies work and what can be done uh, to curb that misinformation's influence on policy and public opinion. 
So look out for working titles, disinformed, disinformation, and the media war on transgender rights, uh, hopefully out in a couple of years. Uh, and with that, thank you all so much uh, for your attention. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Um, and if you happen to have not gotten a copy of the book yet but want to, uh, you can get a 30% discount ordering directly from Oxford University Press if you use the incredibly catchy and easy to remember promo code of ASFLYQ6. Um, thank you again all so much. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, TJ. That was really amazing to hear um, all of this really great research and the insights that you've come up with. Um, we have a lot of great questions here. I'm going to start with one of my questions that is also similar to one of the questions from the audience. I'm going to co combine the two of them. Uh, so the question for me is, given this current anti-trans political climate in the U.S., uh, how do you think social movements and trans activists can best use communication and media technologies to advance trans rights and fight against trans oppression? So kind of just thinking about what you learned yeah. from this case study, which was a number of years ago now, before things really got as bad as they are now. Yeah. Uh, and then the similar question by Allison Stanton is, uh, how have these strategies uh, been less effective potentially over the last two to three years as the, the attacks on trans people have dramatically increased? Yeah, no, I think that definitely there's been a, a significant change in the effectiveness of a lot of tactics for a variety of reasons. One of them being, for example, like Twitter has completely transformed under the ownership of Elon Musk. And, um, and that has transformed the role that that platform has in the broader journalistic ecosystem. And so the idea of Twitter as like an avenue for transforming news discourse is completely different um, than it was. And there kind of isn't a new system yet in place that will kind of replace it. Like there's like Blue Sky and Mastodon, all these other platforms haven't taken off like threads. Who's using threads, right? Like none of this has like really um, been replaced. And so we're we are kind of in that pivotal uh, transition moment where we don't necessarily yet know what the ground rules are. Uh, so it's kind of hard to answer uh, because I think there's a lot more uncertainty in what the media system looks like right now than there was in 2017 and 2018. And I also think that at the time, the, the battlefield was also a lot smaller, right? In 2023 alone, um, there have been anti-trans bills introduced in 49 of the 50 states and passed in 23 of them. The, the scale of operation to combat that versus to combat, you know, the regrettable and horrifyingly scary uh, plans of the Trump administration are very different. There's so many more targets, much more diffused, much more rabid, and with a lot more public support than has historically been the case. Um, and so I think that uh, one of the things that I took away from my time at NCT that I do think is crucial is a lot of the storytelling role. And I think it's regrettable that NCTE is also not the same organization it was at the time that I studied it, um, which I talk about at greater length in the book, uh, because I do think that that infrastructure of having prepared, trained, and deployable trans people across the country is very much what's necessary when, from my theoretical perspective, a large reason why anti-trans misinformation has been very successful is because it can capitalize on on kind of narratives that promote fear and misunderstanding that are persuasive to people because they seem intuitive and they don't have meaningful experiences in their lives that that give them reason to believe otherwise so for people who are experiencing like the possibility of trans youth healthcare being provided as an abstracted issue presented in media discourse and that is being rage bait in digital spaces, they, if they don't have people in their local community 
or something closer to home that really grounds what trans realities are for them and and give them the experiences to like resist the misinformational characterization of trans issues then they don't have what i think is necessary to um kind of not fall for for one of very putting it the anti-trans campaign and so i think that building up that infrastructure is necessary and it's not as simple as saying hey trans people like put yourselves at risk and on the line and just like go out and like publicly declare yourself one of the things that nct did was able to make it look like that was happening but it wasn't these were people who were being provided institutional knowledge and organizational resources to make it happen yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think that's a great answer, and it, it leads into some of these other questions very well. Uh, so there's a question from TJ Gwendling, who's asking, were conservative groups using the same tactics as NCTE in uh, some of their um, organizing? And how do you identify which audiences to spend energy on and which audiences to ignore, given the limited resources? So I think it's, it's very yeah. worth thinking about the ways that some of these strategies that have been so helpful for trans people can also potentially be helpful for anti-trans activists. Yeah, no, as I kind of mentioned in passing at the end, um, anti-trans groups absolutely were doing the same thing uh, and have continued to do so with remarkable success. I mean, we can think about, for example, the ways that they have worked to build network of like D-trans storytellers who they are mobilizing across the country as part of their legislative and media uh, campaigns. And I talk about one extended case in uh, chapter four of the book about the Alliance Defending Freedom using very similar tactics to NCTE in the US state of Georgia and how NCTE and the ADF are basically fighting each other with the same weapons and uh, how was it that NCTE had to work to kind of best ADF when faced with their own strategies and I think that um I'm wait well sorry what was the second portion of the question oh um the second portion was how to if for an organization like NCTE how do you decide which audiences? Oh, yes, how to decide. Them. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the issues is um, you kind of can't, right? Like there's so much. Um, a lot of the decision about audience isn't actually a question of audience and who the prime audience is, but who the power holders are, right? If you have a strategic objective of combat this legislation or promote this legislation or affect um the the information environment of a particular state that is like a battleground state that is all quite functional and utility driven it is there is a place where there is a particular outcome we care about and we need to structure our work against that at the time that i was at ncte if i'm remembering correctly and i may not be i think there were 12 states that were identified as like target states that received the most of ncte's uh, attention because they were the places where the most was happening or the threat of the most was happening that's what do you do now when it's introduced in 49 states right it's one thing to be targeting 12. if you've got an office i think that its peak while i was there ncd was 23 24 people have 24 people fixed 49 states like that scale of work is untenable and i think what we need is a lot a lot of not only institution building within the trans movement, but coalition building across other progressive movements, because uh, the trans community absolutely cannot um, combat this uh, alone. And while there is a lot of wonderful allyship shown across progressive movements, at times it does look, from my observational perspective, that that allyship is less fervent and dedicated than it felt like it was in the early Trump years when everyone was really um, in that kind of unconditional solidarity mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, so many great points there. I'm also thinking about the fact that when we think about the tools that the anti-trans activists have, they're using tools that we wouldn't use, like things like misinformation. You know, they have this extra um, set of tactics that sure we could start doing some of the same types of things but i think that we would agree that 
that that's just right. not a good approach. Right, I mean, probably not. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, I definitely think there is a, an extent to which different audience, or not different audience, uh, different speakers and different movements are held to different standards. Uh, yeah. One of the things, though, one of the reasons, other than ethics, uh, that trans people can't get away with, like, running misinformation campaigns is, like, the press would never allow that. Like, the press would never run the things um, that uh, trans people could misinformationally say, right? misinformation is at its core about the maintenance of status quos there is a there's a line of research uh, emerging in communication studies information uh, studies uh, that is, calls itself critical disinformation studies and it is very um clear that misinformation is a tool of the elite powerful to maintain their place in the social hierarchy. And that is very clear in the way that mis and disinformation circulate um, in the legacy press. Um, people in elite positions of power can spread misinformation mm -hmm. and the oppressed cannot, uh, mm -hmm. even if we wanted to, which again, we shouldn't want to. Uh, but yeah, I, there is a profound asymmetry there. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to combine two questions from audience members that are getting at sort of similar things. So one question is from uh, Eric Joy Denise, who's asking, where do LGBTQ media fit in all of this? Um, things like like the advocate and um, Eric is mentioning how these type of sources are sometimes more interested in wealthy cishet women allies than actual members of our communities. Um, and then similarly, Alison Stanton is asking about the difference between there being in the trans case, this one kind of national central organization versus in the LGBTQ space, there's multiple different organizations. And um, is there anything that you think about this lack of kind of a network of different organizations um, all working on trans rights? Um, do you think that that impacted the success of some of the campaigns, things like that? Yeah. So I considered in, in the book, LGBTQ plus media fell under what I called community media. Um, I, my definition of community media was media that served a particular identity population, which is in contrast to other ways people use community media as being like hyper local media. Um, and in fact, uh, NCT frequently worked with the broader LGBTQ plus media uh, sphere for a variety of things. One, you know, building knowledge and understanding and allyship within the broader uh, community, so to speak. Um, but also because there were times where the national press wouldn't wasn't willing to go somewhere with a story, but the queer press could be counted on more easily. Um, but of course, the queer press also is not necessarily um, always as political as um, like national newspapers are. Like they're they're more frequently running a, a, a broader mix of, of culture and community and profiles and other things like that. And so um, it certainly wasn't a kind of uh, solution uh, to entering uh, the media scape. Um, as for this like network uh, nationally, there are other trans rights organizations, um, both operating nationally and locally. So the Transgender Law Center, uh, the Nas National Transgender, wait, no, no, the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. Um, I'm blanking on other names right now under uh, the spotlight. Um, and there are plenty of local groups. I think that what is um, partly at issue is the size of the trans population, right? The broader LGBTQ plus population is small in its own right. Uh, then add the, the increasing smallness of the trans population, like we can only have so many institutions before every trans person is working for a trans rights organization. Um, and so I do think that um, the allyship of broader LGBTQ plus rights organizations is frequently very important. And I write in the book, uh, in particular in chapter two, but in multiple places throughout the book, focusing on the often uneasy relationship between LGBTQ plus organizations and transgender organizations. 
uh, largely centered around the way that organizations like HRC and other groups like that tended to um, talk in the abstract and fundraise off of trans topics more than there was a lot of on the ground combat uh, over trans topics. Um, I, I don't know the extent to which that has changed uh, since I was in the field. I certainly hope that it has changed. And that's also not true of every organization. The National uh, Center for Lesbian Rights has always been unambiguously uh, in allyship uh, with the trans community. Um, the National LGBTQ Plus Task Force has tended to be better than groups like HRC and so on. Um, but I do think that the success of the trans movement uh, doesn't just mean more trans organizations, although we should have more and good trans organizations. It's part of why CATS was founded, was to bring a, a community of scholars who have skill sets so that we can contribute to that larger collective effort. Um, but it also requires more steadfast allyship and, and coalition, as I said, with broader LGBTQ plus organizations um, and other movements in the progressive sphere as well. Yeah, and speaking of broader coalitions, this is a question from Mira Tay, who's asking about the role of international connections. So thinking about, are there ways of bringing together um, organizations in the US with people from different countries? Or does it seem like people are more sticking within their country um, instead of reaching uh, internationally? So there are definitely groups that are themselves international, things like GATE and other organizations uh, like that. And, you know, within Europe, there's uh, Transgender EU uh, and, and so on. I think, um, I do think that there has been a tendency for organizations to more so, particularly the US organizations, focus on national context. I think for a variety of reasons, again, the scale of work within the country is itself uh, quite large. Um, but I do think that there is a lot to be learned and to be gained from that kind of transnational coalition, particularly as we watch anti-trans movements and campaigners increase their degree of transnational coalition in a way and at a rate that trans movement organizations are not doing, right? When you have ostensibly left feminists from the UK who are participating in events with Christian nationalist organizations in the US, like they didn't just bridge countries, they also bridge like political ideologies and they have found ways to make coalition surrounding, you know, their uh, aims to oppress trans people. Uh, I do think that the future success of the trans movement uh, and of trans movements will require a certain degree of transnationalization if only because, you know, the people fighting to oppress trans people have transnationalized. Um, and I, I don't know what that would look like right now, again, particularly, as I said, um, NCT is not the same organization that it was. Um, and I do think like the national presence of trans organizations right now feels kind of weaker than it historically was. Um, but I, I think that that is absolutely needed for success. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get to another question by Eric Joy Denise, who's asking about the decentralization of online organizing and how that could have potentially harmed some uh, BIPOC, queer and trans people and organizations. So specifically more, I guess, grassroots type of organizations that don't have these large, you know, HRC gala kind of resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, NCT didn't have HRC gala resources quite either. It certainly had more than grassroots organizations, but there was a big resource disparity between the largest LGBTQ plus groups and the largest trans rights groups. Um, to the extent that what NCT was doing was harmful to local groups, I don't, I don't know that there was like a lot necessarily to say about that that I observed. Um, I do think that NCTE was at the time not always among its leadership but certainly among its um work kind of working staff was a lot more conscious about um working with rather than working on top of largely because they had been worked on top of by lgbtq organizations quite a bit um but um yeah i don't know i didn't because i was in the national office in dc i didn't like have on the ground observations in, in various states to the greatest part outside of some observation I was able to do in Massachusetts during the Yes on Three 
a campaign uh, centered on uh, protecting Minis uh, Massachusetts um, trans inclusive legislation. Um, but I, I do think like a lot of the people who were part of NCTE's uh, networks of VTE and FTE um, were members, sometimes leaders of local groups. There, there was definitely not an either or thing. It was not like you worked with NCTE or you didn't. Um, a lot of the people in it ran local parent groups or uh, ran local community groups of various kinds or were on the boards of other organizations. Um, and so there was a to a large degree, uh, cooperation uh, rather than competition. Uh, but that's not for me to say that there wasn't any, I, just of what I was able to observe, it was not prominent. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a question from Dorian Rose, who is asking about in the context of the UK, so there's been proposals uh, to not offer things like puberty blockers because they're uh, they claim that they are cost ineffective. And so they're using that to justify uh, not prescribing those to trans youth. Um, but this isn't something that's generally public knowledge or people, it sounds like, wouldn't really be sure if that was true or not. Um, and the question from Dorian is, is this is a form of soft power in the same way? Um, I'm not sure exactly what they're referring to, but um, is there anything that that you've seen in your research that is a similar uh, type of thing. Yeah, I think one of the one of the big issues with that type of misinformation is it's number one easy to believe, but people very often already believe that healthcare costs are poorly managed and and other things like that. And it's hard to counter argue without getting into like nitty gritty and studies and things that are not compelling media fodder. Because what do you say when someone says uh, providing trans care is cost ineffective? You say, no, it's not. Like that's not a particularly compelling uh, fight. And a lot of times the narrative around, oh, it's too expensive is a pretty easy narrative to understand and to get behind but it's harder to build a narrative around no it's not right because a lot of times the effect of misinformation or the effectiveness of misinformation isn't just the fact that an untruth was told and someone believed it but that an untruth was packaged into a story that resonated with people and changed the way they viewed a broader social phenomenon and that narrative embedding is what's crucial. And so talking about the narrative inefficiencies of the health system, which are easy to point to, because they go out of their way to make it inefficient, um, that's an easy story to tell. But trying to turn around and say, but no, I promise it's not that expensive, doesn't have the same resonance uh, for the public. And also, like, the public doesn't care to be educated on the cost of health care for, uh, for, you know, hormone replacement theory, therapy or whatever the other forms of expensive costs they're alleging are. Um, and that makes it really difficult for, for trans movements to be like, how do we you know, message this? Um, there's not like a clear answer of, oh, that'll work. And I think we are still in that kind of testing space of trying to figure out what it is that we can say other than, hey, I'm a trans person and I need this, please care about me as a human, which is you know, what we do what we are doing and what we need to do, but is clearly not working as much as we want it to. Yeah, so it's almost like that's just kind of an excuse because they don't want to fund it anyway. And if exactly. it were cost effective, then they would, you know, bring up other things. Absolutely. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask about is related to the methods that you used in mm. your book. So you conducted this ethnographic study, you did all of these interviews, and most of the books that have come out in transgender studies prior to this don't usually use empirical research methods. It's more um, theory and close readings and things like that that are really great, but are very different. And can you talk about how you chose to use this empirical ethnographic approach and what do you think some of the differences are between that approach um, that is more data-driven and mm. something that's more theoretical or humanities-based that a lot of the research in trans studies tends to be. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I feel like a lot of my work before I entered the field was driven, whether it was literary or social scientific, and I had kind of done all of the above, it was always very centered on text, right? What are journalists saying? What are the 
proven or or you know theoretically possible consequences of the way issues are talked about. Um, and a large part of why I changed was kind of approach was not because I thought those textual bases like weren't helpful. I think they were immensely helpful um, for myself and others, I hope. But um, I got to a point where I realized like I'm I'm ignoring like what is actually happening, right? I'm I'm letting myself kind of stay stuck in this discussion of what is possible or what is likely when I could just go and see what is actually happening. And particularly given my kind of uh, philosophical beliefs about the importance of academic research, I was like, I also more helpful if I'm able to look at what's happening to understand why it's happening and to imagine on the basis of that information, that data, what could be done. Um, because I have a, a strong commitment that is represented in, in cats, obviously, but also in a lot of my other work. I have a, a book coming out in the spring called Public Scholarship and Communication Studies, which I co-edited uh, with the brilliant Sylvia Weisbord, and uh, that is focused on in an era of media crisis and communication crisis, how do calm scholars make themselves useful to fixing the problems of the world? We kind of talk about like, we are very extractive as scholars if what we do is we look at the social problems in the world and we say, how can I turn this into my per own personal career advancement, but not find ways to have that work speak back to meaningfully addressing that issue. And I don't think that everyone who studies social ills and isn't trying to solve them is like inherently doing something bad, but I felt like I wasn't doing good by doing that. And I felt a, a moral imperative to make my work mean something, even though I I know that what academic research can do is limited, right? Like, you know, we're not, we're very infrequently changing the world in any measurable way, but I would rather do a little bit of something than do nothing. And I, I felt like the empirical methods I used were necessary for that uh, because of what I study and the fact that I study media and politics and social movements. If I studied other things that wouldn't necessarily mean I needed empirical methods to do that, you know, so much of like more humanistic trans studies has had profound impacts by changing the way trans people see themselves, understand themselves, develop political consciousness. Um, but that's not the type of work that I do. So writing that way wouldn't have been impactful. So, um, you know, this was all my modest attempt to do research I felt mattered. Yeah, thank you. And I think that the research in combination with things like cats and, you know, getting the research out to people who need to hear it and in combination with activist work that we all do, I think that that, um, that together can kind of make sort of the difference that sometimes academic research on its own is lacking. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Gina Gwenfrawi that's about burnout, and I think this is something that's really important to think about. The possibility that trans grassroots organizations will suffer from burnout, how does this relate to understanding the flows of trans networks in relation to media networks? Um, I know that probably a lot of the people that you were uh, interacting with at NCTE were um, probably trans themselves or, or LGBTQ. And we all know how exhausting it is to yeah. to do work that's related to our own identities. Um, is that something that came up a lot in your research? Yeah, absolutely. A burnout, I mean, I think it's an issue for trans people in general, given the state of the world, but is also very much a salient problem for uh, trans community members and trans activists, and certainly was a major issue at NCT while I was there. I was there during a time in which there was a lot of tension in the organization around uh, issues of you know, racial justice within the organization in terms of staff, but also in relation to um, staff burnout. Uh, and other things, there was a push for a union while I was there uh, and, and after I left. Um, and I think that um, so, met, so much of the kind of underlying reasons for why NCT is no longer the organization that it was, has to do with the poor management of uh, that burnout, which is certainly on corporate leadership, because like that's what leadership means, but is also a, a structural feature of trying to do this work and to do this work in 
a, a model where it's inherently underpaid and undervalued because nobody's throwing money at, at, at activism of this kind. And so um, I don't know what the answer to it is. I, I, I'm not sure anybody agrees. Like, I, communal care is a very important part of it, but cannot be the entirety of it. Um, and I, I, it's in many ways what opponents of trans rights want is they want people to be exhausted and to give up but you know we we don't give up because you know giving up means not having a livable life so um but yeah i think that the success of the movement uh is in large part going to be determined by uh the ways that our organizations and our grassroots networks um provide structures of care for one another that make the work more endurable um long term yeah, I think that is so important, the structures of care, because even if there was tons of money being thrown at these organizations, it doesn't fix the fact that in media cycles, sometimes things happen extremely quickly. You have to really, you know, get get started, get to work extremely quickly, work long hours, and still also have it tied with your personal identity. So, yeah, um, yeah I think that money is not going to solve the problem, even though would help to some extent <laughs> a little bit yeah yeah <laughs> um so here's another question kind of going back to something we were talking about towards the beginning of the q a around uh, social media platforms and specifically how things have changed with with twitter uh eric joy denise is asking how much is the reliance on social media platforms owned by problematic, such as white cis het male dominated companies distorting or organizing, especially with the fallout of uh, Twitter or X, what alternatives are there? So I have lots of answers to that question, but I, I want to like pick apart part of the question that was saying, like, how much is it or just is it distorting or organizing? I don't know that I agree 100% with that premise, although I understand what it's saying, because like there is no organizing outside of the institutions we operate within, right? Like even if we're organizing to fight those institutions, our our organizing is structured by those institutions. And the ownership of technology platforms is not meaningfully different in that way than ownership structures of mass media and of other forms of media and short of uh only communicating with each other you know in person in public space that is by the way structured by the state and also disappearing because public space is in becoming increasingly privatized i don't think that there's any escape you know that's the you know insidious nature of neoliberal capitalism there's no escape from being constrained in what our organizing looks like by any of those institutions and that has been the case for possibly eternity. Um, but I do think that the, the precise way in which these platforms are centered around individuals and are so volatile to the whims of those individuals and the instability that one person can introduce to the entirety of our media system nationally, if not internationally, is mind blowing and terrifying in almost like, uh, you know, uh cosmic way um because you know as much as the new york times is owned and the washington post is owned they also do have like institutional structures with some degree of resiliency even if ownership changes or if ownership applies pressure then that has been very evidently not the case at the social media platform formerly known as twitter um and i'm not sure that it would be the case as much at Facebook, I, I think you know Facebook looks from the outside as being more resilient than than Twitter, um, but it is still obviously very much so centered around the personal vision and leadership of Zuckerberg, um, and so I, I think that that goes to broader questions of what media ownership means for freedom of speech not in a legal sense but in a philosophical sense and what it means for our ability to have robust community conversation yeah i mean you say there's there's no escape from these things and in some sense i agree but also i think about smaller trans-led media companies things like translash media 
which right. is amazing. And, you know, I've heard you on their podcast and um, yeah. And I've, in my research, seen lots of smaller social media platforms, online communities that are yeah. created by trans people for trans people. And often they don't last for very long. They're very precarious because they they rely on the free labor of yeah, people the burnout. running them. And yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, but do you think there's a future there for us in just creating our own media? I think there is for the community. I think where it becomes an issue in terms of our state facing or our, you know, just broader society facing activism, it's hard to turn community built, community oriented media into external change. And so to the extent that we're doing organizing amongst ourselves, I think absolutely it can be transformative and is often necessary. Um, and, you know, is a long history of, of movements and communities making their own media, you know, that just once upon a time was their own newspapers. Um, but I think in terms of the way it affects our ability to, like, affect the state, I don't know that it is able to do as much for us as these other forms of media that are not designed for and often designed in ways that are hostile to trans mm -hmm. people and their needs. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately, we're not going to get to all of the amazing questions that have been submitted. I just wanted to close with one question that I had that I thought might be relevant to some people in the audience, and that's what advice do you have for trans academics or other trans people who want to write a book? Oof. <laughs> um, definitely have a great community of support around you. Definitely have lots of friends willing to read things over and over and over again. Um, and I would say, uh, I don't necessarily have advice in a, this is the way you can make it, because I think I didn't do anything in a, in a very specific way that made it more achievable for me. I think that um, I have very much benefited from uh, the work of so many people who've come before me who have made the academy care about trans people in ways that they historically didn't. Um, and if I had written this book five years ago, it very likely wouldn't have been published, or at least not by Oxford. Um, and so I think in, in so many ways that we are in a moment in which a lot of uh, publishers uh, are more uh, attentive to the intellectual, political, and cultural contributions of trans writing. I think finding people who believe in not just what your project is as a project, but also believe in the responsibility of publishers to platform our work is very important. And I, you know, I worked with an incredibly wonderful editor at Oxford who did very much believe in the project, uh, but even Oxford is not perfect in that regard. As if uh, many of you will know, Oxford has published work by Holly Lawford Smith repeatedly, which is violently transphobic and horrifically misinformed. And uh, there's been a lot of internal agitation within Oxford about the fact that um, their editors in the UK uh, allowed that project to go forward. And so um, a lot of the relationships you will build that make it possible are individual relationships with editors and are not necessarily going to be the relationships you build with institutions. But there are people there who believe in the value of our work. Um, and also a lot of us who are doing this work and publishing these books are sharing knowledge and information with one another. So, uh, you know, I know Oliver is working on a book um, and I know there are plenty others out there uh, who uh, could uh, use the connections that I and Oliver and many others have. And I can't speak for everyone, but I can speak for myself at least that I'm always happy uh, to talk to people through email or whatever and, and share the information and the context that I have, uh, because I do think it's, always important, but especially now that more of our voices are being heard in the academy. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy to talk to folks as well. Um, and yeah, to close, I just wanted to plug the book one more time, uh, Voices for Transgender Equality. You can order from Oxford for a discount. You can order pretty much anywhere you get books. Um, the book really is a page turner, even if you're reading it as a PDF <laughs> when, when you can't turn physical pages. But um, but yeah, I mean, the way that, that TJ uses these ethnographic vignettes to really kind of make you feel like you're there in the organization in DC as these, um, you know, political events are happening. I think it's, it's really um, fascinating in a way that many academic books 
are not like it's definitely not dry um so definitely recommend Thanks. getting a copy and um thank you all for being here with us today and thanks TJ for the talk and for answering all of the questions and yeah. Thanks so much everyone. Bye.